Hi everyone, thanks for watching Lori Wired, and in this video I'm going to show you what to do when your Android decompiler fails. Now, decompilation can fail for both benign or malicious reasons. Maybe the Android decompiler just wasn't able to handle those particular instructions, or maybe the developer actually threw in some obfuscation code to try and mess up decompilation on purpose and purposefully prevent reverse engineering. But once this occurs, you have a few different options that you can try to still reverse engineer this application. First of all, you can try to force your Android decompiler to decompile the instructions and just hope that the output is actually correct or includes a partially correct output. The next option would be to try other decompilers and see if any of them are able to handle the instructions successfully. Or finally, if the, both of those options fail, you can actually look at the underlying Smalley code in the application. And this is going to be the intermediate language for Android that is kind of like reading assembly. This takes a bit, little bit longer to reverse engineer, but it is actually successful if you need to do this. So let's look at an example and see how we can handle this failure of decompilation. So I'm going to open up my application and I already have a method selected that actually failed to decompile within JDEX. So if I scroll down, I see all of these different warnings saying that JDEX is warning it's missing a block for this particular code block, but the actual error is that code decompiled incorrectly for this A method. And if we look at the actual instructions that are right now inside of A, it's just saying that it's throwing an unsupported operation exception because that method was not decompiled. Now, the first thing that I would try here is I would try to force decompilation to see if JDEX is actually successful in decompiling this A method pretty well. So I'm going to go to File, Preferences, and then what we want is this show inconsistent code option. So this is going to force JDEX to show us the code, even though it might be incorrect. So I'm going to check this and click save. And then it's going to reload my method. And now I see the actual implementation of this A method inside of our selected class. And you can see this is a really long method. So I would really prefer to look at the nice decompilation of Java in this rather than trying to read all of those Smalley instructions. So this looks like it did a pretty good job decompiling it anyway. So from here, I would just go ahead and continue my reverse engineering as normal. And then I can see all of the different references to the method and everything that I actually want. Now, if this had not been successful, the next thing I would probably try would be to attempt to use another Android decompiler. The main option here would be Jeb, but this is also a paid for option. The next might be JD GUI. And finally, you could have Recaf, which is coming out with an Android option very shortly. So what I would do is I would give all of those a try to see if any of them are able to successfully decompile this method where JDEX has failed. But if that was not successful, the final option that you have would be to look at the actual Smalley instructions that comprise this application. Now, Smalley, as I said, is kind of an assembly-like language for Android, and it's actually not used in the actual execution of an Android application, but it is a human-readable assembly language that we can take a look at if the Java decompilation has failed. Now, if you're in JDEX, you can simply go over to the Smalley tab, and this will show you all of the Smalley instructions inside of your app. And if I scroll down here and I'm taking a look at all of this Smalley code, this includes all of the code for each one of my methods that are defined inside of this TYR, etc. class. And this is the actual method of interest. Now, this Smalley code is going to be here whether you have checked the force inconsistent code option or not. You can always go back and forth between the code and then the Smalley window if you're wanting to look at the actual underlying instructions. But if I take a look at this, you can see it kind of does remind you of assembly, but it's super, super long. Let me see if I can get to the bottom of the method. So all of this is still part of the same method until we get to the bottom part here. 
So I would definitely much prefer to look at this in Java, but let me look at a couple of the different instructions just to give you an idea if you are forced to actually read the Smalley. It is still definitely attainable and you can totally reverse engineer this application. So I'm going to start from the constructor. We can see that this method is defined by this dot method directive. And then this special init keyword is actually going to be the name of the constructor. If we want to see other method names inside of this application, they're actually going to match what we see in the Java decompilation as well. So you can see A is defined here as another method. And if we go back to our code, a is the actual name of the method here, even though this is the actual constructor name, which is of course going to match the class name. But if I go back to my Smalley code and I wanna start seeing what this is doing, I'm gonna to go to my constructor and here was our method name. This is going to define the parameters that we're taking. And then this V is signifying that this method returns void. And this is going to be the actual signature of this particular method. Now, if we wanted to look back at A, we can see that this actually does take parameters. This L Android content context is going to be the fully qualified class name for this particular argument. And if we see in the code, this is just a context object right there. So that name is actually going to match. It's just going to be the fully qualified class name that's going to be used inside of the method signature. Now, if we want to start looking at some of the instructions that comprise this method, first of all, we can see dot registers three. This means that we're using three registers inside of this method. The registers are going to look like this or this. So V0 is going to be one register. P0 is going to be a second register. And then if we scroll down, V1 is going to be our third register. So we shouldn't see any other registers used inside of this method except the number that we have defined. So V0 is going to be a local variable, and then P0 is going to be our first parameter to this method. Now you might be saying, hey, this doesn't actually take any parameters, you already said that. But actually the first parameter is probably going to be a pointer to the current object that this method was actually invoked on. So this is going to be kind of like the this keyword, if you're familiar with that. Now, if we move on to the actual instructions, we're defining a constant string here, and then we're going to be moving the empty string into this first local variable. And if you want to have a helpful reference for looking up these different Smalley instructions as you're checking them out, what you can do is you can go to the actual Android official documentation. I'm just going to copy this instruction and open up my Dolvik bytecode reference and I can do control F and then find this actual instruction. And this is going to tell me what it's actually doing if I'm not sure. Let me zoom in and make sure you can see that. What this const string is going to do, it's going to move the specified string into the register that's passed in as an argument. Now, sometimes this is not very specific about the actual order that the variables and arguments are going to be coming in. So I also have a reference that I'm going to be posting that is going to be available in the comment section of this video that shows you exactly which argument is coming in which order. So all I need to do is I need to look in my Smalley instruction reference and I'll look for const string. And this is going to tell me what order my actual arguments are coming in. So this is going to be register. So this is going to be the register where the string reference will be stored. And then this second argument is going to be the actual string. So if we look at our instructions, first argument, comma, second argument, so destination register, and then the actual string value to be stored, which is going to be the empty string in this case. So that is the way that this is actually defining a new variable. And if we take a look at the code, we can see that this empty string is declared right here, but it's also going to be used inside of this call to super. So let's see how that is going to get invoked. I'm going to go back to my Smalley code. And this invoke direct is a very special keyword that's actually going to be invoking a method. So we want to take a look at that. We can look at our Dolvik bytecode reference. And there's multiple ways to actually invoke these methods. If we take a look at the specific definition for invoke direct, this is actually going to be invoking a non-static direct method. But if we want to take a look at what arguments this is expecting, we can go back to our Smalley reference on GitHub. 
and look for Invoke Direct, and we see this is the actual mnemonic for the instruction. This is going to be the argument registers, and then this is going to be the actual method that this invoke direct is going to be invoking. If we take a look at our registers, we have P0 and V0, so let's take a look at what these registers are actually doing. The first register is going to be the object on which this method is invoked. And if you remember, this first uh -oh. parameter is going to be the this, so the current instance on which this method was actually called, so the current instance of the class. And then the second register is actually going to be a parameter that's passed to the target method that they're trying to invoke. Now the target method is going to be this second argument right here, which is actually going to be, if you remember, the special constructor keyword is going to be in it inside of this intent service class. So this is the fully qualified class name. And then this is gonna be the actual method signature that they're trying to invoke. You can see that this particular constructor is expecting a string as a parameter, which is indeed passed to it inside of this v0 variable register. And if we take a look at the code, that's just the more complicated way of calling super and passing in the empty string. Now let, let's take a look at one more example and take a look at a couple more lines inside of this Smalley code, just so you can get the idea of how this actually works. Next would be new instance. This is just creating a new instance of the class and storing it inside of this v0 register. And then it's actually going to be invoking another method that's going to be defined inside of this a class since we are passing in the v0 register as the instance of the class that we're trying to invoke this upon. And it's going to be calling that constructor. So it's calling the a constructor, which takes no parameters and returns void. Next, we're gonna be calling this I put object. And so let's take a look at what this is actually doing. So this is defined up here. This is going to store an object from a register and put it into an instance field of a specified object. So basically what that means is it's going to take an object that we have declared and put it into one of the instance variables of the class that it's actually specified. So this is gonna be one of the local variables of the class. So let's see where it's actually storing this. We have a few different arguments here. Let's see which order they're supposed to come in. First is gonna be the source, so that's going to be holding the actual object that we want to store. That's going to be this v0 object, which currently holds the new instance of this a class. The next argument is going to be the actual object or basically the name of the class whose field you want to update. So it's going to be one of the local variables stored inside of this specified object. And this is pointing to the current class right now. So it's going to be a local variable of this TYR, etc. class. And if we look up here, we can see all these local fields that are defined inside of this class. These are going to be our instance variables. So we're going to be updating one of these to store in this reference. Now, if we go to the last argument, this is actually going to be specifying which field we want to update. You can see the actual field you want to update. So this is naming the class that we're stored in, and then the actual field, which is going to be defined up here. So this is what we're going to be updating, and that is going to hold this reference. So basically, what these three lines do in a lot of additional ways are take a new instance of the A class and then store this into a local instance variable called A. And if we take a look at the Java code, this is just, that's just a complicated way of saying this dot a equals new a. Now from here, we could continue on and keep looking at all of the different instructions inside of this. Or if we were actually analyzing this, we would go ahead and take a look at the Smalley code for this a method and kind of go by hand and make sure that we're understanding exactly what happened, or maybe try to kind of decompile the Java by hand if that's easier for you to read. 
But you could go through now and actually reverse engineer this method to understand its full capabilities. So thanks so much for watching Lori Wired, everyone. In this video, we learned what to do if our Android decompiler actually fails at decompilation. We saw that this could happen for both malicious and benign reasons, and we learned that we could try to force decompilation, use a separate decompiler, or even actually look at the underlying Smalley instructions that comprise that particular failed method. Now, Smalley instructions are the human-readable, assembly-like code for Android applications, even though it's not actually used in the execution of Android apps, but it is totally possible to reverse engineer an application that has failed decompilation just by going through and reading and understanding the actual Smalley code. So thanks so much for watching Lori Wired, everyone, and I'll catch you in the next video. Well, we died at the same time, so I'll take it. There's my body. <laughs>